So far as we can understand from the Bible, there are three orders of beings. Most Unitarians, I mean by that Jehovah's Witnesses or Unitarians some others, believe there are more than three orders of beings sometimes. But the Bible only speaks of three orders of beings. There are humans, there are angels, and there are divine. Divinity, you're going to call it that. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, it tells us that Jesus made a little lower than the angels when he became human. So humans are lower than angels. Angels are higher than humans. So there are angels and there are humans. Now one text, a little lower than angels. Hebrews 2, verses 6 and 7. Now there are many texts that talk about Jesus being higher than the angels. Uh, Isaiah 40, verse 28. Copy fast with you. Isaiah 40, 28. Isaiah 57, 15. Isaiah 63, 16. I'll read them again. Isaiah 40, 28. Isaiah 57, 15. Isaiah 63, 16. Psalm 90, verse 2. The 90th Psalm, verse 2. Habakkuk 1, 12. Habakkuk 1, 12. In all these texts, we are taught that Jesus was higher than the angels. So they're what we call divinity, the highest order, God and Christ the Holy Spirit. Then the angelic, the angels, and then the humans. Three orders of beings. Most Protestant churches and the Catholic Church believe that. There are a few exceptions, as we've talked about before. Now, only divinity, only that which is God, is self-existing, eternal, without creation, without birth, and without end. Divinity possesses life within itself. It's not dependent upon any other person or power for life. Divinity is self-existing. It's a source of life rather than dependent on someone else for life. As soon as you make someone a son, you make them dependent on another person for life. They came into being because of someone else. But the source of life is not dependent on others for life. Now, some people confuse this, and forgive me, I'm racing. Some people confuse the word spirit. The Bible says God is a spirit, and the Bible says the angels are spirits, all ministering spirits. The word spirits in the Bible simply means the unseen world, the unseen creatures. That's all it means. You do not see God, so the Bible calls him a spirit. You do not see the angels, so the Bible calls them spirits. But it does not mean that God and the angels are the same order of being, for the Bible differentiates in other places, you see. So there are only three orders so far as we understand from the Bible. So when someone tries to tell you Christ is another order between angels and, and God, say, where would you find that in the Bible? Another te- question you need to ask, and by the way, always ask questions. Where does the Bible say that God is one person? The Bible says God is one. But where does the Bible say God is one being or one person? In other words, just be stupid, and you'll be smart. If you try to be too smart, you might be very stupid. <laughs> but just ask them, you know, where does the Bible say, just like you're a kindergartner, that God is one person or God is one being? Where does it say that? To my knowledge, the Bible doesn't say that anyplace. It says God is one. One what? There can be one of many, can there not? You are one congregation. How many are here? <laughs> this is one building. How many rooms? You can go on and see. This is one family. How many people? All sorts of things. You see, one has more meaning sometimes than we give them credit for. Now, some of the difficult texts here, uh, I want to tell you first of all about the nature of Christ and about this idea. Was he a son in his pre-existent form? Before he was born of Mary, what was he? Now, we call him the son of God at that time. And we believe he was the son of God at that time. But was he a son in the idea that he came after the father, that the father preceded him? In the Bible, uh, Problems in Bible Translation, page 202, the book I gave you a little while ago, page 202, ordinarily the word son conveys the ideas of derivation and of inferiority, of derivation coming from somebody and of inferiority, the father being above the son, you see, both in dignity and in time. It means the father is higher in position and preceded the son in time. So he's ahead of him in derivation and, in, and also in inferiority. The term son includes a relative idea which implies priority of existence in the father and subsequency of existence in the son. Priority means coming before, subsequently coming after. So it implies a relative condition. The son came after the father and the father came before the son. The term son uh, implies that. Therefore, contradicting absolute eternity, Christ is divine and therefore, not ne- therefore necessarily self-exists in absolute and separate independency. He was not conceived by the Father in any sense. Not at all. In his pre-existent form. Now, stay with me. I'm only talking about before he became human. Don't get mixed up. I'm only talking about before he became human. What was he like before he became human? Was he a son? We call him the Son of God. Why does the Bible call him a son, then? Some of the questions we have. Now we'll try to start answering some of them. 
Uh, was he after the Father? Now, many texts, by the way, that uh, the Bible calls him the everlasting Father in Isaiah 9, verse 6. calls Jesus that. Micah 5, verse 2 is a marvelous text about his uh, nature. Uh, his independence of the Father. 1 Timothy 6, verses 14 to 16. Who only hath immortality. 1 Timothy 6, verses 14 to 16. Hebrews 7, 16 and 24. Where we've been studying about Melchizedek as compared to Christ. John 1, verse 4. John 1, verse 4, and John eleven twenty five. 25. Now, the Bible calls Jesus in the King James Version the only begotten in several places. In John 1, verses 14 and 18, John 1, verses 14 and 18, John 3, 16, John 3, 18, and 1 John 4, 9. He's called the only begotten, or the only begotten Son. Now, the word there, and we'll try to show you on the board, the word there is the top word, monogenes. The word in John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Only begotten son is this one Greek word, monogenes. Mono means one, genes means kind. In no sense does it mean begotten. He was the only one of a kind. There was nobody else like him. So he's the only one of a kind, not the only begotten. The Bible does not say he was only begotten in John 3.16. It does not say that. That's a mistranslation. Totally and completely. In other translations of the Bible, it's often more accurate. So be very careful about this. Now, the word for begotten is the second word. Try to pronounce it if you can. Gegenemanon is the word. Gegenemanon. That means begotten. So if John 3.16 said he's the Gegenemanon, not the monogenes, it would have to be translated as it is in King James, the only begotten of the Father. But it doesn't say Gegenemanon in Greek. It says monogenes. And it says monogenes, he's the only one of a kind, not he's the only begotten. So those two words are tremendously important. You'll find them in the book, Bible Problems in Bible Translation, discussed very freely. So Jesus was the monogenes, not the begotten. God so loved the world that he gave the only one of a kind. The only one son of a kind. No one else like him, yes. I couldn't tell you. <laughs> you have to go back and study the history of the translation. I do not know. Uh, anybody who can read Greek, the Greek New Testament, I have one at home, I was going to bring it tonight so you could see it. It has monogenes. And all the translators... By the way, in the Problems of Bible Translation, it quotes all the authority. And they all agree monogenes is the word, and it must be translated only one of a kind. So there was no one else like Christ. Now, this word is used of other people in the Bible uh, when you begin to discuss it. Now, page 197 of Problems in Bible Translation, it defines what it's meaning. The Greek word is a compound one, monogenes, and is generally used of an only, therefore unique, very precious child. Now, this is the meaning of the word. It's usually used of an only, therefore unique, very precious child. The emphasis being on only and not on kind. He was the only one like him. No one else like him, you see. Now, this word is used about concerning Isaac, monogenes, in uh, Hebrews eleven seventeen. Now, Isaac was not an only son. There was also Ishmael and there were others. And he was not the firstborn son of Abraham. Ishmael preceded him. But he was the only son who was the son of promise. Read Galatians chapter 3 about the two sons there. Therefore, he was the monogenes, the only one of his kind, the unique son. Ishmael and Noah was like him. So it doesn't mean only. It means only one of kind. Get the idea? There's no other one like him. He's the unique one. He's the uh, one kind one. There's no other son like him. So this word, and it's used in several places, the text I gave you, Always means the only one of a kind. God so loved the world, he gave his only one son like him. No one else like him. And that's what it means about him. He's very unique. And so you'll have to understand that he was not begotten for people to come along and use that on you like a club. You'll have to understand it doesn't mean that. Try the book Problems and Bible Translation along and you can bail yourself out. Now, the only time the Bible speaks of Jesus being begotten is when he came out of the grave. The Father begat him from the dead. Christ raised himself, the Father called him. Whenever the Bible talks about the resurrection of Jesus, it correctly calls him begotten. But he's begotten from the dead, not begotten to life in his original sonship to God. That's different. You have to talk about his pre-existent form, his human form, his resurrected form. The three different areas. Now, in his incarnation, when he became the Son of Man, born of Mary, and it was conceived of a woman, you see, and born, in that sense he was born. But the Bible talks about him being begotten when he came out of the grave. That's correct. That's Gegenemanon. He's begotten when he comes out of the grave. But originally, before he became a human being, he was not begotten. 
He was monogeny. The only one of a kind. So read problems in Bible translation. Now there are texts about this Gegenemanon, by the way, Acts 13, 32 and 33, where he's begotten from the dead. Acts 13, 32 and 33. Romans 1, verse 4. All referring to his coming out of the grave. And if you look at Adventist Commentary, volume 5, volume 5 B.C., page 683. Five commentaries, 683. It talks about is being begotten, it's coming from the grave. Now, the idea of his being subordinate to the Father, which is implied by the term Son, and being under the Father, only took place at the birth of Jesus to Mary. In other words, being lower than the Father, and the Bible talks about this in many places, such as Philippians 2, verses 6 to 8. Philippians 2, verses 6 to 8. And Hebrews 2, 9. This always talks about his taking humanity, lowering himself from divinity and becoming human. And that con in that sense of the word, he is a son. He's under. He's subordinate to the Father. He is after the Father. See? In his humanity. You must be careful what you're reading. Are you reading about Christ in his humanity, Christ in his resurrection, or Christ in his pre-existent form? You separate all three and look at the text. Decide which of those three is talking about. You'll have no problem. He was never begotten in his pre-existent form. He always was. And he always is. And he always will be. There's no, way, no sense the word is begotten in his pre-existent form. But subordinating himself in humanity and the begotten of the Father coming out of the grave are correct terms. So a son being lower than when he was, became human and begotten when he came out of the grave. Keep those straight. Now the other difficult text in the Bible, Colossians 1.15. And they could hit you with this one very fast and you wouldn't know what happened to you. Colossians 1.15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Born. That's what it says. The firstborn of every creature. And this could easily be applied to his pre-existent form. The firstborn of every creature. Angels and humans and all other beings. You see, The firstborn. Now the word there is the third one that you see up there in Greek. Prototokos. Prototokos. And uh, in Hebrews 1.6 I'm sorry. Yes, Hebrews 1.6 This is used also. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Bring in the first begotten. That's prototokos, and it's used begotten there. This refers to his incarnation in Hebrews 1, 6. When he was brought into the world. Do you see the terminology there? When he brought, was brought like that. But in Colossians, it's describing the one who precedes all creation, even the angels. Not one who comes after creation, such as in Hebrews 1, 6. So you have a problem there. So it cannot refer to his incarnation in Colossians 1.15. In the Adventist Commentary, Volume 7, page 191. Volume 7 of the Commentary is 191. It seems best, therefore, to regard prototokos as a figurative expression, symbolic, describing Jesus Christ as first in rank, the figure being drawn from the dignity and office held by the firstborn in a human family, or more precisely, the firstborn in a royal family. The firstborn in a royal family is called what? Crown prince. Somebody is studying about kings, right? We all live in a democracy with no kings. We don't know what it means. He's called a crown prince. That means he has the right to the throne. He's the next in line for the throne, right? The crown prince. So in a royal family, he has unique uh, power. Christ's position is unique, authoritative, and absolute. He has been entrusted with all prerogatives and authority in heaven and earth. So instead of being firstborn, it should be translated, one who takes priority over all of the creation. One who takes priority over all creation. The preeminent one, above and before all that is created. If you read the whole of Colossians 1, 14 to 18, it emphasizes Christ's preeminence. Read the whole context. You don't even have to know the Greek at all. It emphasizes Christ's preeminence. The one who takes priority over all creation is the meaning of this word there in Colossians 1, 15. See, a, a firstborn son in the Old Testament, way back in the Old Testament, would receive a double portion of the birthright. He'd become the priest of the family when the father died. And he would also be the king of the family. So he had three offices that came to the firstborn son of a family. Now, so all firstborn sons were looked upon as preeminent above all other children or all the sons. He was above them. So we believe in Colossians 1.15 is talking about Christ's position, not about his birth. You understand? He takes the highest position in the family. There is no one higher than his. He is the preeminent one. There's no one higher. The idea... The one who takes priority over all creation. There's no one over him in all of creation. He is over all. 
So we believe that prototokos means the highest one, none higher than he is. And that does not mean born, it means a symbolic language, the one who is the highest of all. Another difficult text is Revelation 3.14, and this is the last difficult one we're going to discuss tonight here. Revelation 3.14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now the faithful and true witness is Jesus, according to Revelation 1. It calls him the beginning of the creation of God. He's the beginning, he's the first of the creation, you see, so he's created, right? He's the beginning of the creation, he's, he's being created. That's what it says, the beginning of the creation of God. The language is very clear. Now the word there is the last word on the, on the scope up here. RK is the word in Greek, and that's for beginning. That's all we're worried about is beginning. Creation will take care of itself in this case. He's the beginning is what it says in the King James Bible. In the Adventist Commentary, volume 7, page 760, 7 BC, page 760, R.K. refers to that which initiates an action, a first cause, a prime mover. So understood here, it declares Christ to be the creator. It says that which initiates an action, the one who starts the action, not the result of the action, the one who starts it. A first cause, a prime mover. So understood here in Revelation 3.14, it declares Christ to be the creator. So a better translation, he is the beginning of every creature. The beginner, rather, I'm sorry. He is the beginner of every creature, not the beginning. He's not the first of every creature. He is the beginner, the one who starts all creation, meaning he's the creator of all. So it should not be translated beginning, but beginner, E-R, not I-N-G. You understand that? And the Adventist commentary will help you there. Now, there are many other things you can talk about, but in John 8, verse 53 to 58, John 8, verses 53 to 58, Jesus declared himself to be the I Am, to go back to the story about Moses at the burning bush, where Jehovah spoke to him in Exodus 3.14. Moses asked him in Exodus 3.13, who to say he sent him? You know, he said, say, I am that I am, I sent you. In John chapter 8, Jesus said, I am. And by the way, they started to stone him for blaspheming God, which means they correctly understood he claimed to be Jehovah. And he did claim to be Jehovah. That's exactly what he was saying. Desire of Ages, page 469 and 70, for your consumption, others won't believe it outside of Adventism. With solemn dignity, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Silence fell upon the vast assembly. The name of God given to Moses to express the idea of the eternal presence. What does it mean now? To express the idea of the eternal presence had been claimed as his own by the Galilean rabbi. He announced himself to be the self-existent one. He who had been promised to Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from days of eternity, Micah 5, verse 2 in the margin. I gave you a text a while ago, Micah 5, 2 in the margin. So this terminology, I am, describes the one who has the eternal presence. The I am is present tense of the verb to be. And if he says I am, it means he always is. You can never say he was, and you can never say he will be. You cannot say that of I am. I am always is. You can go back 10 billion years, and he is I am. You can go in the future 10 billion years, and he's still I am. He's not I will be. He's not I was. He is always I am. That means there never was a time when he was not, and there never will be a time when he is not. He always has been, and he always will be, and he always is I am. Now, this is extremely simple language, but I see it stretches some of your brains a little bit. Uh, you just stop to think about it. That's exactly what it means. I always am. You can't say I was, you can't say I will be, I always am. You say I will be, it means I'm not now. You say I was, I was then, but I'm not now. That's not true. Wherever you go in time, future or past or now, he's always I am. He always is the ever-present one, which means he's the self-existent one. So in no way did the Father ever come at a time when the Son was not existing. The Son was always there from all eternity. The Father never preceded the Son. Never. Nor did he precede him in, the, in position, in prestige. They were always there in the same in time. Now, I am identifies him with Jehovah. And I am is a special description of Jehovah. And I am has in it the meaning that he always is. And only, the only one like him is the Father, you see. And if he's God, is he verily God? Or are there different kinds of gods, as the Jehovah's Witnesses say, you see? When I went to the three orders of beings. They try to make more than one God in different orders, you see. 
So there's the God and there are other gods. And I say, show me that in the Bible. And the Father, the Father begets him from the grave. And that term is used in the New Testament frequently about begotten from the grave. But if you just use the language of the New Testament, you know, you can't miss. Because if he is truly Emmanuel, God with us, if he's not Emmanuel, God with us, then we never have had God. God has never joined himself to man yet. If God has not joined himself to man, how can we be saved by someone lower than God? Someone with equal the law must come, you see. The lawgiver himself must come. There are many ways of discussing this. It's a very complicated subject. The only thing we have is in the spirit of prophecy, of course. In Patriarchs and Prophets, Story of Redemption, Great Controversy, there are some things about this. But that's all we have in the Bible. What attempts were made to save angels, I don't know what the Bible says. But of Satan, it definitely says, in the fallen angels, you see, that they had the opportunity to behold his love. Man has not. Not in his fullness. It's the a demonstration of that love and the expression of it that gives man opportunity to be saved. There are things we did not know. We sin in our ignorance. When we do know, will we still sin? So by knowing the fullness of his love, we could be changed.